Hello and welcome back to Amport. This lecture we are going to discuss how we can integrate external data sources with Apache Spark. So till now we are only using Apache Spark in your local system and using our data files which are already stored in our local system and we got that from our github repository but that is not going to happen in the real world you will be having like multiple data sources and your data could be coming from any rdbms sources or no sql databases anything it could be so we are going to see how we can integrate external data sources and we can read and write the data using apache PySpark. so without further any ado let's get into it Okay, so let's get started with interacting with external data sources with Apache Spark. So Apache Spark is an incredible tool because it lets you integrate different databases as your source as well as the target for saving the data. So that's why it makes it a very versatile tool to work with the data. So in this lecture, let's see what are user defined function which can work with both Hive and Spark and will also see how we can integrate external data sources such as JDBC and different SQL databases. And in the next lecture, we are jumping on to integrate our Spark with the most latest NoSQL databases like Apache Cassandra as well as the MongoDB. So this will be really interesting. So without further any ado, let's get into it. So in the previous lectures, we have explored interacting with built-in data sources and also we have look, a closer look at DataFrame API and its integration with Spark SQL. So we will now focus on to how we can integrate our Spark with different data sources. But let's talk about the user defined function for a bit because it's a pretty useful feature for creating your custom functions. So Apache Spark has a pretty useful built-in function. It has the flexibility to allow for any data engineers or data scientists for defining their own functions. So these are nothing but called as a UDFs or user defined function. So the main benefit of creating our own PySpark functions is that we can able to make use of them within the Spark SQL itself. So for example, a data scientist can wrap an ML model within the UDF so that a data analyst can query its prediction in the Spark SQL and you will not have to understand the internals of the model. That is the power of user defined function. So this is one a simplified function which we have made which is cubed which takes an integer argument and returns the cube of that argument. So all you have to do is you have to use the register method stored in the spark.udf and you have to pass your function as well as the data type which it accepts. That is so simple. So here we have registered our cubed function and also we have created a data frame which stores simple numbers from one to eight and we have created a temporary view on top of it. So all about the temporary view we have already covered in the previous lectures. So we have created a temporary view UDF test and we have just submitted a simple SQL query. And here we have called out our cubed function to make a cube of our IDs. So IDs is nothing but the number from one to eight and it's cube in the next column. It is so simple to implement and you can make your own custom functions to serve your application and different roles like data scientist, data analyst can use this function and they don't even need to know about the functionality of the piece. So that is the power of the UDFs. But there are some perks that we need to discuss to get the more understanding. So the example which we have just seen has some issue of using the PySpark UDFs because they had a slower performance than the Scala UDFs. So this was because the PySpark will require the data movement between the JVM and the Python. This is a known issue for years and it is quite an expensive operation. So for resolving this problem, now we are going to see the Pandas UDFs and it is also known as the vectorized UDFs. So it were introduced as a part of Apache Spark 2.3 version. So this Pandas UDF uses the Apache arrow for transferring the data and Pandas to work with that data. So all you have to do is you define a Pandas UDF using a keyword Pandas underscore UDF as a decorator and you will wrap it the function itself. So once the data is in Apache arrow format, then no longer need for serializing the data because it is already in the format which is consumed by the Python process. 
So this is one a simple example of the pandas UDF. All you have to do is import the required packages as well as build a Spark session. So we are just creating the same Q function here, but the pandas UDF. So all you have to do is just execute this and you can just create it using the pandas underscore UDF, which we have just discussed. So just execute it. And once you got a series of one to three numbers, you will get a cube of these numbers. So once you execute it, you got the cube of all these numbers. So I hope this makes sense. And you can then switch to the Spark data frame where we can execute this function as a Spark vectorized UDF. So as you can see here, we have created a data frame and executed the function as a Spark vectorized UDF. So this was all about how we can implement user defined function in Spark and how we can speed it up by using the pandas UDFs. Okay, so let's jump on to the more interesting stuff, which is integrating our Spark with external data sources. So till now we have just imported our CSV file, which is already present on your local machine to create the data frame. But what about how we can integrate different databases outside Spark? Because in real world, let's be honest, we are not going to have some files sitting in your local PC. You will be having a production data, which is already there in some source database. So whether it could be a SQL database or a NoSQL database. So that's why we have to learn about of how we can connect our SQL databases with Spark using the JDBC connection and what properties and inputs you need to provide for that purpose. So Spark SQL will include a data source API, which can read data from many databases. And it simplifies the querying of the data sources as it will result it as a data frame. So thus it will provide all the benefits of the Spark SQL, which includes the performance and ability to join with different data sources. So whether you have like multiple different data sources, one could be SQL, one could be PostgreSQL, one could be MySQL, no matter what, you can integrate both the databases and join them together as a data frame. So this is how you can integrate different data sources with Spark. So for getting started, we need to first specify the JDBC driver for our JDBC data source and it needs to be on the Spark class path. So from the home directory of your Spark, you will issue the command like the Spark shell and you have to provide the driver class path and the jar file. So the jar file is pretty important for making the integration with the source database. So here are some properties which you need to provide while making the connection to your source database. So the first one is the username and the password. So these are very normally provided as the connection property for logging into the data sources. Because let's be honest, our data sources will be encrypted all the time. Then comes the URL, which is again a very useful feature for connect making the connection. So here you have to provide the JDBC connection string. So the second one is like the example for the PostgreSQL where you need to provide the username as well as the password. And you have to also be providing the port number to able to connect to your database. So it varies with database to database. And we are going to see those in the upcoming lectures where we'll integrate different data sources like Cassandra, MongoDB with our Spark. Then you have the DB table, which is nothing but the JDBC table for writing and reading the data. And also you can provide the query. So query is nothing but to able to read data from Apache Spark. So it is like a simple NC SQL query, but you have to remember that you can't specify the query and DB table option at the same time. Either you have to do the DB table or the query. And then the last one not least the driver. This will be like the class name of the JDBC driver for connecting to that specific URL. So these are like the mandatory properties you need to provide to make it connection with your source database. But there are some aspects like the partitioning, which you need to understand before jumping on to the practical approach. So that we are going to see now. Okay. So before jumping on to the hands-on part, let's discuss about the importance of partitioning in Spark. So when transferring a very large amount of data between your Spark SQL and the JDBC source, it is very important for partition your data sources. So all your data will be going through one driver connection, which can saturate and significantly slow down your performance 
of the extraction and it will also potentially saturate your source system as well so as you can see these are the different properties you which you need to provide to make the exec extraction process more efficient but these are like the optional step but for every large scale operation it is very highly recommended for using these properties as shown in this table the first one will be the num partition which is like the max number of partition which can be used for parallelism in table reading and writing so this also determines the number of concurrent connections of your jdbc then comes the partition column so it is nothing but a column which is used for determining the partition so either it could be the date or time stamp whatever it is so for example if you are dealing with the geographical data your city name would be the partition column for your data set it totally depends on which type of data you are handling and according to that you have to provide the partition column in your partitioning strategy then comes the lower bound and the upper bound so these are like the min and max value of partition column for the partition stride so these are totally optional but to make the data transfer process more efficient and also if you are not gonna burn your resources then definitely partitioning is a must thing to do for the large scale application so there are some hints which you can follow while using these properties so the first one is so once you are getting started for, with the num partition a very good starting point would be to use a multiple of number of spark workers so for example if you have like the four spark worker nodes then perhaps start with the four to eight partitions but it is also important for noting that how well the source system can handle the read request so for the systems that have processing windows we can max maximize the number of concurrent requests to the source system so for the system lacking the processing windows we can reduce the number of concurrent queries requests to prevent the saturation of our source system so that that was the first hint the second hint was you have to calculate the lower bound and upper bound based on the minimum and maximum partition column values so for example if you choose like the partition num partition as 10 and the lower bound at 1000 as well as the upper bound at 10000 but all of the values are between 2000 and the 4000 then only two of the 10 queries will be doing all the work so that is also not the ideal solution and the last pointer is you have to choose the partition column which can be uniformly distributed so for example if the majority of your partition column has the value 5500 and you have mentioned like num partition as 10 and the lower bound and upper bound as 1000 and 10000 respectively then most of the work will be done by the task which requests the value between 5000 and the 6000 so instead we can choose the different partition column or else if possible we will generate a new one so that that is how we can use the partitioning strategy in your spark application so enough talking we have talk about the user defined function as well as how we can integrate and what are the different properties to provide to get connection to your jdbc database now it's time to go more practical now in the next lecture let's integrate one of the most popular databases out there which are cassandra and the mongodb so this will be very interesting so i'll highly recommend you to go to this lecture before jumping on to the practical part because these concepts are very important to make you a good spark developer i hope you like this lecture so please subscribe to our channel and also ring the notification bell to get the latest updates and don't forget to follow us on our social media which i have linked in the description below thanks for watching